About 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I first met Gay Talese. I had the privilege to have a conversation with him over the last 10 or 12 years. Part of it was in my book, The New New Journalism, and then it's been in various events as various of Gay's books have been published. Uh, we've done a number of events at NYU and, and elsewhere. And one of the things that's always been amazing to me as I have read and reread his work and taught his work over the years is the number of students who have reacted to it and the variety of students. I've taught his work. I've taught Frank Sinatra has a cold in Chile, Denmark, South Korea, Japan, uh, and students who have no connection whatsoever to the phenomenon of Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack or anything like that, who don't know any of this stuff, whose English may be tenuous, uh, they, they get this, they react to it. It's, it has a kind of effect and power that transcends those things. And it never fails to amaze me. Um, I see some of my students here from various other cultures who have also had that experience uh, just this very last semester. Um, so uh, there's a very nice review in this coming Sunday's uh, uh, New York Times book review, oddly enough, written by a colleague of mine, a woman who has an office about 150 feet from mine, uh, very complimentary uh, and attests to, again, this the power, the enduring power of uh, Mr. Talese's incredible combination of intensive and uh, relentless reporting and beautiful uh, writing that feels effortless, but of course has an enormous amount of effort put into it. I want to start off this conversation. We're going to talk a little bit and then go to questions because people always have lots of questions. I want to start off by talking about uh, the fact that in this this book, it's a wonderful collection, both of relatively new pieces and also selections from some of Gay's books and uh, other articles. And in it is the famous Frank Sinatra has a cold, uh, voted by Esquire and others, the greatest magazine article ever. And um, and that and then then the book it's bookended by this wonderful piece about an opera singer whose name I always mispronounce, uh, a Russian opera singer, uh, 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 what's it, Pols well, uh, Marina Popovskaya. Popovskaya, uh, who uh, <clears throat> Gay I it was about two years ago in Gay traveled around in Russia in Argentina, following her around. And they're interesting bookend pieces because they're both divas. They're both people with extremely well-curated senses of self and sense of self-preservation, uh, presentation, although very different. And I was just wondering about thinking back on uh, the, the experience of the Frank Sinatra piece, which he's also written very eloquently about in this book, um, and then the more recent piece. What's changed and what's remained the same for reporting and, and writing uh, for you? Well, and thank you very much for uh, for being here tonight. What, what's changed? Uh, I might be overlooking changes, but I don't feel or believe in my case there are changes. I I don't believe that that the long ago Frank Sinatra or the more more recent piece <clears throat> about the opera singer. In terms of my research, my legwork, the following of a person, the, the curiosity about the person, the patience with the person. That patience is very important, but we'll deal, deal with that a bit more. But I don't think the methodology of this kind of work is, is changed. Technology has made no difference to me. I don't have a cell phone. I don't use anything that I think of as 21st century tools. I think that what I do is what I did. Uh, 85 in a month was like 25 years old, which is, I was maybe 28 when I did Frank Sinatra. I don't exactly know. I don't think in the 60 or 50 years I do the same thing. What is it? It's, well, we all have this curiosity that in the classes of Robert Boynton and, and maybe some of you who are Students of journalism, if not practicing journalists, it's curiosity. Then what? Then it's indulging your curiosity. How do you do it? You get yourself an introduction. That's sometimes very difficult. You have to know how to get the door open. You have to know how to knock. After the door is partly open, you have to know how to, without being surreptitious or without being disrespectful, get them to open the door a little bit. And then to make your pitch, and what is your pitch? How do you do what you do? 
whether you're Frank Sinatra, whether you're Donald Trump, whether you're Marina Papaskaya, whether you're Rabbi Ben Ezra out of some poem by Byron, how do you do it? How do you do it? They said, well, what do you want to know? Why do you want to know? Because I think what you do is representative of this time, even though you're not maybe known for it, maybe you're not a household name, well, that doesn't mean what you do is not very relevant, is not connected to what other people do and think. I think there's a story here. A story, they will ask, yes, there's a story. What is the story? You're the story. Many of the people that I talk to do not think they're a story. Some of them do, and I tend to sometimes avoid Sinatra, for example. I never wanted to do Sinatra, but I'll talk more about that later. Whatever it is I want to do is I want to know how other people do what they do and how they do it. It's genuine curiosity. Very often, I think how I am different from the people I'm writing about. And sometimes I am like the people I'm writing about, especially when I'm writing about people that are not particularly well known. I don't want to sound falsely modest tonight, but I have thought, thought, always thought that reporters are generally not well known. I wrote a whole book called The Kingdom of the Power about reporters and editors and copy readers, etc. I was amazed by the success of that book. It was the first time, I, believe, I do believe, it was published in 1969. Um, I believe it was the first time that I took characters who are living characters and working for the newspaper, the New York Times, and wrote about them as if they were fictional characters out of some short story or out of a novel. Because I thought reporters, copy readers, publishers of newspapers are characters. Yes, they always say we report the world and we're not reported upon. Well, that's wrong. We are reported upon. So I wrote about them. As I wrote about stevedores, as I wrote about bridge building, I wrote about ladies that feed pigeons. I wrote about people that cut the grass at Yankee Stadium, people that ring the bell between rounds at Madison Square Garden. All these people are characters. Are they well known? Not necessarily. But can they be well known? Yes, you surely can through your prose the way you write about them, the way you write about them, the way you know them, the way you travel with them, the way you see the world as they see it. That's seeing the world as others see it, having a curiosity that goes around the corner into their world, not yours, and you try to see things from a different point of view. That's not very prevalent these days. In fact, we're not getting into a lecture on journalism, but I'll tell you one thing. I think that where journalism is failing now is too many of the reporters are so educated to be with educated people. They don't see the story from uneducated or relatively informally, slowly, or do not see things from the point of view of a working class. We're not getting into the Trump triumph. I don't want to deal with that. But I'm merely saying there's a whole world, part of America, that is underreported, if not ignored, because of the tendency of educated people to probably, to be with educated people. It's much more it's much more simple educated. I mean to be with educated people is much more comforting. That's but we're we're wandering. Excuse me, Robert, you must keep me under I, 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 I know it was, I, I was it's funny. The very first time I sat down with Gay Talese to talk to him, you know, I'd read him for years and it was two thousand and uh, f uh, about five or four or five. And I went down to he has this wonderful office below this gorgeous uh, brownstone uh, townhouse that he and his lovely wife, Nan, share. And I went down there, was ushered down there. It was a blazing hot day in the summer of 2004, I think. And I was dressed in my journalist's finest, namely, you know, jeans and a, not a t-shirt, but a, a polo shirt. And Gay was dressed as Gay is, is dressed now. And uh, it was wonderfully air conditioned down there. And I remember you had fresh flowers, fresh cut flowers. And I thought, this is the kind of office I want to have one day. <laughs> and I... And I said, and I was doing this book, The New New Journalism, and I said something to the effect of, so um, so, how do you find your stories? What is interesting to you? And he said, well, five generations ago in Calabria, and, and it went on from there, I thought, holy crap, how am I ever going to get a book out of this? You know? 
and and there's a but you know the thing about gay Talese is his the point always comes. It's always there's a there's an arc. There's a long arc, but well, it always comes. Well, I hope we get there pretty soon. We'll get there soon. <laughs> well, there, but another factor in the journalism is is that you, something you wrote very poignantly at the end of that essay about writing Frank Sinatra as a cold, mm. and you talk about the current journalism that's going on and what's missing from it, which is really quite close to what you just said. You say, talk about this kind of journalism that was, I'd say, uh, charitably underreported. You say, they are opinion pieces of intellectual or cultural content or articles that are decidedly reflective and personal and not dependent on costly time and travel. They are works researched out of a writer's own recollections. They are close to a writer's heart and place of dwelling. The road has come, become too expensive. The writer is home. And I think that there's a kind of physical at-homeness because of expenses and budgets. Yeah. But there's, you're also talking about a kind of intellectual at-homeness. You want to talk to people like yourself. And that's, that's a real failing of contemporary journalism as well. If, if, if there are <clears throat> freelance writers in this room, I will wonder, as I do to freelance writers I know in my own private circle, I wonder how you do what you do. Because what you do not have now that I had when I was in my 30s and started writing some of these pieces you refer to, I had an expense account. I was able, in the synopsis story, since that's the best known story, to spend 33 days in California, staying in a hotel, while I was interviewing countless numbers and numbers of people who at one time or another knew Frank Sinatra or, or had some connection to Frank Sinatra, they played in a band, or they sang, or they dated the guy, or they made clothes for the guy, or they drove his car, whatever they did, they knew something about Sinatra. But I was there for 33 days, expensive hotel, ran up an expense account that in those distant mid-1960s was something like $3,000. That sounds, that's big money today, it was big money then, but the editor never said, even though you're not seeing Sinatra, it never said, come home, we're not getting what we want. I wasn't sure they were getting what they wanted. I was sure I was getting what I wanted. I didn't even know what I wanted. Until I came back to New York and started writing, did I know that the story of not seeing Sinatra was better than if I had seen Sinatra. But the story of the opera singer, which is a different time, and a different method, too. You spent, but I mean, much of the piece is you trailing around with her and actually developing kind of a relationship, an occasionally hostile relationship with her. Well, the the opera singer and, and Sinatra, very self-absorbed and very talented, were both, even the opera singer that gave me access, but she was very difficult to be with. And at times said she didn't want me around. Sinatra didn't want me around, but she didn't either. Not for long periods, but for a couple of days. I was traveling, as Robert said, first to Moscow, because her, her, she was born in Moscow. She was in her very early 30s, just the height of her career at the Mount Bonton Opera, but had experience in some of the great stages around the world. Sung in La Scala and, and sent in Rio de Janeiro, some of the great places. And she was going to go to these places. She was leaving Moscow and going to go to um, Buenos Aires, to Teatro Colón, to sing with, with Daniel Barenbaum's uh, group, to sing Verdi's Requiem. Then she was going to go from Rio de Janeiro to Barcelona to sing Carmen in the opera house there. And then she was coming to New York and she was going to appear in La Traviata in the lead, lead part and a, and a month or so later in Don Carlos. And she, so she was a very accomplished person, but she was also a very difficult person. And sometimes I remember when I first went to Moscow, since I don't speak Russian, and she wanted me to meet her mother and grandmother, which, of course, I wanted to do. They became part of the story, just as Frank Sinatra's mother is very much part of that story. In fact, the, probably the best character in that whole Sinatra piece is the mother. 
Well, the mother of Marina Pavlovskaya was a, was a chauffeur, and she drove us around Moscow. And while I was asking questions of the chauffeur mother, the soprano was the translator. And also true that the grandmother was part of my story. The grandmother was the wife and widow of a soldier in the Russian army who was very much an active soldier as Germany and Russia were in that part of the world and that great part of the war. The opera singer was very angry later in the day when she, during rehearsal, her voice cracked, a Sinatra's voice cracked. But she said to me, you're ruining my voice, having to translate for you when you talk to my mother, grandma. You know, I, I'm going to be, I'm not going to be performing well with Mr. Barenbaum because of you. I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Marina. What do you want me to do? I said, I want you to stay away from me. We're in Moscow now. I'm supposed to be on a plane the following day to go to Rio de Janeiro. I said, well, listen, I have a ticket. It's on the same plane, but I'll change the plane. Well, let me think about it. Well, a couple of hours later, she didn't say to change the plane, but we didn't sit together. So it's a long flight from Moscow to Rio de Janeiro, about, about 11 hours or whatever. So I'm sitting in one part of the plane, and she's in another seat. We didn't talk. We finally landed, and there was a driver that she had, the opera company in Rio de Janeiro. I mean, not, I meant... Um, in Argentina, Buenos Aires. I said Rio, I meant Buenos Aires, excuse me. Uh, I said, do you want me to take a cab? No, you can ride with me. So we check into the hotel. Of course, I said, you want me to move to another hotel? She said, no, you can stay here. I had a red. For the next two days, she wouldn't talk to me. But this became part of my story. The pieces are there with how difficult she was. And then we had breakfast one time, and there were too many flies around the buffet table. She screaming at the guy, too many flies, how can I eat here? Well, this is part of the story. And then she got mad at her room, at the room. She wanted to change hotels. Oh, okay. So I helped her pack, and we went from one hotel. To, that's part of the story. This is good stuff. But it's not good stuff if you don't know it's good stuff. And you don't know it's good stuff unless you have a story-writing mentality. And where does that come from? Well, it comes from a lot of places. But in my case, it came from reading short stories, fiction. That's one thing I did. I didn't have a great literary background. My mother and father, you might know from reading, owned a store, my mother a dress shop, my father a tailor shop. But what I did do in magazines such as the Saturday Evening Post, which is what I read, come from near Philadelphia that I never heard of the New Yorker until I went to college. And I didn't go to college in Princeton. I went to the University of Alabama, but I heard of The New Yorker. But somewhere between high school and college, I started reading good short story writers, John Cheever's stories or John O'Hara's stories or just whatever was published. And I wanted not to be a short story writer, not to be a novelist, not to be a poet, not to be a playwright. But I wanted to be a journalist that wrote short stories with real names. A short story could be 800 words, 1,000 words, 5,000 words. But it has to be a story told scenically, dramatically, description, what they look like, what they sound like. Take the reader into a scene. So it's Frank Sinatra at a bar scene. Maria Papaskaya screaming at a, about the flies in this buffet table in this hotel in Buenos Aires. It's whatever the pieces in this and other pieces or in newspapers, when I used to write for newspapers, it was the same thing, stories, stories, stories. So that's all it is, storytelling. What, what, one of the stories that, you're, that you, it comes up again and again, and even just in your telling this, you talked about how Frank Sinatra's mother was one of the best characters as she was in that piece, and how you wanted to meet Polskaya's uh, mother, her grandmother, uh, in, in, in your, your book, uh, uh, Unto the Sons, uh, and now that I father, it's also about intergenerational. You're, you're, you're fascinated by this sort of intergenerational power struggles, love, hate, what you inherit, what you don't want to inherit. W w where does that fit into this whole storytelling? I mean, why this intergenerational fascination? Well, I, of course, speaking, you have to realize this is just my story. I'm speaking to you. I'm, I'm not sure I share out here with this audience, 
things, many things in common. Maybe I do. But since I was born when I was, which was in the 19, I came of age in mid 20th century, in post World War II America. I was born in 1932, 1943, 44, the war is going on. I'm not quite a teenager. I'm in Ocean City, New Jersey, near Atlantic City. I have an Italian father who has two brothers fighting in the Italian army. I knew this because there are photographs of the two of them in my, on my father's bureau in his bedroom. So as a boy of 14, I mean of uh, 12, I knew that there was a story in my house, within my family, my mother and father, that wasn't something I was comfortable with because I had two fascist soldier uncles. So if you're a boy of the war, post-World War life, which is what I grew up in, but during the war, I saw a different story. I saw the war from two points of view. I'm not even near a war, but I'm telling you, in the patriotic 1940s, when we had people caring about soldiers because they were conscripted, you had people, everyone had a soldier in the family or someone working at a defense plant, uh, rationing of food. They were really involved with war as nobody is today in this time of our volunteer army and such a different way of life here with wars going on and very few people caring. But we cared greatly, but I cared in a particularly con con conflicted way about those two foreign soldiers that were part of my blood. So I, at that, that time, I wasn't even thinking about myself as a writer of short stories, I wasn't. But I certainly was seeing different sides to stories. Now let's just jump to Moscow with a soprano. Her grandmother told me, Marina's grandmother, what it was like in World War II in Moscow, what it was like to be in Russia. Her husband, her the, the grandmother's husband was injured in the war, and she told me about how the Russian people suffered and how the Russian people, as much if not more than any other people, fought Nazi Germany with strength, valor, and a lot of sacrifice. I listened to this elderly woman, younger than me, but certainly an elderly woman, talk about her life as a youngish woman in 1943, 44, from the Russian point of view. I, she made such an impression upon me that jump ahead to all the anti-Putin bashing that we can't escape, no matter whether you write newspapers or watch stuff. It doesn't quite get to me. I keep thinking of Marina's grandmother and the Russian people in World War II. Yes, we all read War and Peace, and we know that Tolstoy got it right. But the character then was, was Napoleon, but now we're talking about Nazi Germany. No, now we're talking about Putin. But I'm thinking in terms of Tolstoy, and, and, the, and, and the invasion of Napoleon, I'm thinking of World War II and Marina's grandfather fighting in that war and injured that war and never quite recovered from that war. And I'm thinking of Marina and her generation of the new Russia that is so vilified by this administration and this coming administration. I'm not buying it because I have a sensibility triggered by that grandmother, just like my own Italian uncles who fought in the fascist army when everybody wishes we were on the side of General Patton and Eisenhower. You, but you I want, saw different points of view. Do you, you, want, want, you, you once described to me your point of view as a Calabrian point of view. Can you say what that means? Calabria is a part of Italy. Those of it, the, the map of Italy is the toe of the boot. It's the poorest part of Italy, I think. And that's what I come from. And I remember when I was in the army, that was 1944, 45. There was no war, just the Cold War. But I was stationed part of the time in Frankfurt, and I was a lieutenant in the tank corps. And one time on a furlough, I, I was able to fly from Frankfurt to Rome and Rome to Naples. And Naples took a train to the Calabrian village. And this was in 1955. And it might have been 1555, because the people there were in the feudal age. They were living... In long ago centuries, there was no such thing as an automobile. These, the, these are the people with my last name. 
on the top of a hill, most of them farmers, only mules were the means of transportation. And in their homes were straw mattresses, animals that wandered in and out of the house. The kind of abject poverty that I saw that was my, these my people, my people, and I thought many things. I'm wearing this uniform. 10 years after the war, it's 1945, and I'm thinking, they must see me as Dwight Eisenhower. But I was seeing myself as a stranger in a uniform, not a fascist uniform that my uncles used to wear, but not entirely comfortable in this conquering uniform of the American post-World War II Army. 10 years late, but still the surrounding of this village called Maeda in Calabria was no different than it had been in the war or the World War I or the war of, the, of, of, of practically the war of the Middle Ages because this place hadn't changed. And people with my surname were people who were so poor that they had no idea what life was like beyond the village because they rarely travel because there's no way of getting, you're in the mountains and the hills, and the only way you go from one village to the other is on a mule. This is 1954, 55. And I am seeing Lieutenant Gay Talese talking to other people whose name Talese, the same spelling. And I'm seeing and imagining my father leaving these people. He never went back, my father. He left at 17 and never went back. And I went back, and I saw that were it not for my father making a boat trip in 1920, nine-day boat trip to America, I would be in one of those straw mattresses sleeping with cow and sheep next to me. It's just that, that one trip, and I saw all this. So, Yes, I'm a reporter, but I'm also, as with the grandmother of Marina or my uncle's, or my own seeing myself in a uniform, uh, I saw myself not a, I saw myself as a farmer. I saw myself as a guy whose father didn't make a nine-day boat trip away from the 15th century into where I was born in 1932 in Ocean City, New Jersey, by the beach. It's just strange. And so the reporter in me is always looking at something from the other side. And I'm always looking at myself as somebody else. I have a detachment and an intimacy at the same time. Great for reporters, because whether I'm talking to Frank or not just Barber, I'm talking to Joe DiMaggio's bartender, I'm talking to Marina's grandmother, I'm talking to Arthur, Hel Arthur Hayes Salzberger's best uh, valet. I don't care who it is I'm talking to. I'm always thinking, what are they? what is their story? How are they different from me? How do they grow up? Who, what, what kind of uniform did their uncle wear at World War II? I mean, whatever it is, I'm looking at them and me, them and me, and I'm writing about that way, short stories. I know. It's a hard question. I'll, tr I'll try to translate this. The, uh, thank you. What she's really, I think, getting me to think about is, is the, essentially, how do you begin knowing what you have from your research and you're finally now sitting with this person well, I don't really like to think about how I begin because how I begin is to try to make myself comfortable and the person that I want to know more about comfortable. And what it is like, I think, is like a first date. You don't interview, I mean, you have a first date, blind date. And I think of what I want, I want a relationship that begins with a date. And what I want to do is know that person very knowingly, so I don't want to interview them. But I want to have a sense by hanging around what they're like, what they like to do, what they do, how they do it. All this kind of hanging around is not so question and answer. Not, that's why I don't use a tape recorder. I just want to sort of have a sense of people rather than a specific answer to a specific question. Now, of course, 
you're not going to get, at first try, people opening up to you. There's something that comes out of all of us that serves us well when we're trying to win someone's confidence. I'm not saying you're trying to sell them a vacuum cleaner, but you're trying to sell them yourself. So in a way, you are a salesperson. But just because you're selling yourself or trying to sell yourself by getting them to open the door and let you in and tell you something about themselves, it also has always been part of my nature to be very respectful and not to ever do knowingly any harm to the person I'm writing about. What I mean to say, yes, it's, it's a relationship. It's not a one night stand, it's a relationship. There's a responsibility I always felt I had and have to anybody I'm writing about, celebrity or an ordinary person. But it's, but it's also, I don't want to take advantage of people. So much of journalism now, and probably was true when I was young, is gotcha journalism, gotcha journalism. They just, people, people sometimes look bad. Hatchet writers have always existed, but I feel that uh, with the excuse of speed, because people have to do, do something so fast, there's so much competition, there's so much harm. I always think that some, every edition of the New York Times, every edition brings harm to somebody, brings harm to maybe a, a, a book review could be. I've had my share of bad reviews. That's one example. Or f f a p person who has been not only misquoted but maligned who might be in public office. Or somebody who's been misunderstood, said the wrong thing or said what they didn't mean. So often people say something and it's recorded on a tape recorder. It's not what they mean. It's not what they mean. That's why I don't use a tape recorder. I want to know what people mean, and I want them to reflect upon it, and not to be nailed because they said something. And today, with this new technology, you could be killed many times. But I'm off this subject. I'm sorry. It's Robert, right. let's get back on you the message. You once, you once said to me something apropos, that, you, that you, there was no person you had ever written about who you could not run into the street and have a conversation no, right. with and be in good terms with. And I was always very struck by that. Uh, yeah. Let's have there. another question, though. I'm sorry. Yes. We didn't answer. Any other questions? Yes. Way in the back. Set up and yell. Raise your voice. Raise your voice a little bit. That's a good question. She said, "Just because you didn't, just because you say you didn't hurt anyone, does that mean everyone was pleased?" Uh, I don't. No, I, I can't say that that's true. I don't really. Um, Frank Sinatra, was he pleased? I never heard. <laughs> no, I don't mean that that's special. I mean, I never heard. I never heard from Marina either. I never heard from, you know, you don't necessarily get love letters because you're right. Even if you did, even if they were disappointed. But didn't, didn't Nancy Sinatra tell you that her father actually liked She did yeah. 30 years yeah. later, you know. But you're not writing for a fan letter in the hopes of a fan letter. But what you're writing, how you write after it's published, you have to ask yourself, could I have done better? Could I have been, did I possibly misunderstand or did I do, did I bring justice to the trust the person exhibited in allowing me into their lives to the degree that they did. It's, it's like you have a, again, you had a date, you broke up. Did you behave well? Were you mistreated? I mean, all these things that you think of in your personal lives, it also has relevancy in your relationship as a journalist to the subjects you're writing about. I think it also is significant that you're such a workhorse that I don't, I don't think anyone has ever doubted that you put your all into a piece, even if, say, Josh Logan probably didn't 
wasn't crazy about that piece, but I doubt that someone like that ever doubted that that you would put everything into it and got something yeah. true about him, you know? Joshua Logan, you might not know, but once was one of the leading Broadway directors of, of, of my time, best known in my time for South Pacific on Broadway. Mr. Roberts was another big Broadway play. They, they also a movie in both cases. He was a big, big name. Um, the only thing he objected to, this was an article. I won't spend much time on it. But he had a, I was able to watch him rehearse a play. I had access, as I did with the singer Marina. One time I witnessed on a Broadway stage on a Broadway stage, prior to the opening, this is during a rehearsal, a confrontation between the director, he's a white man born in Louisiana, and a confrontation between him and a black woman who was the star of this forthcoming play called Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright that consisted of an entirely black cast, Diana Sands, big names in those days, Al Freeman Jr., Claudia McNeil was this large, talented, volatile woman. And she started screaming at Joshua Logan one day, uh, Joshua Logan, during a rehearsal. He said something, and she took it wrong. And, and I'm sitting there, sitting in this empty theater, and I'm taking notes, and I'm watching the two of them scream at one another. I believe it is not uh, false that while he was married, Joshua Logan also was gay. Just like Noel Coward, just like maybe Lenny Bernstein. It's just, and it was known. And this black woman said, no, no, he said, oh, Claudia, you're acting like some queen up there. And she said, you're the queen. I wrote it down. <laughs> I wrote it down. And went on and on. When I wrote that piece, I called him up. I mean, before, I mean, when I finished writing the piece, but before I published the piece, I called him up. I said, um, and his wife answered the phone, Netta Harrington. I said, can I speak to Mr. Logan? Yes, just a minute. So I said, Joshua, I want to tell you, I'm going to thank you for allowing me to watch you rehearse. But there's this scene that took place between you and Claudia McNeil. And I want to tell you what I heard. And I want to ask you, did I hear correctly? He said, what did you hear? And I said, I heard this. Opera. I gave some of the dialogue, which was very, very caustic. And then she said, and you said, oh, Claudia, you're acting like some queen up there. And she said, you're the queen. I said that to him. And there's a pause on the phone. He said, I wonder if you could change that. How would you suggest I change that, Joshua? Well, can't you say mistress? And I thought, yeah, I can do that. So for that Esquire article, I said mistress. But years later, after he died, and there was a ch chance to have that piece in a collection, I changed it back to Queen. Just an example, it didn't, it's better to have a Queen. But why, why embarrass this person? Oh, oh that's what he said, a hard nose report. Oh, yes, what he said, we have it on tape. Yes, we did. What the hell, we have it on tape. Big deal. Why hurt that person? It doesn't make them, the article didn't need it that much. There was enough in that article, believe me, that the reader knew how about this confrontation between this very, very, this prima donna, Claudia McNeil, and this sympathetic, but somewhat shaken Broadway director named Joshua Logan. That's well, an example. That, that anecdote speaks volumes about uh, the, the sensitivity and the, the work you put in your reporting. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, first, the opening story that you have, 
I went to Catholic school. Too. I didn't take the bus, but I went to Catholic school. And I'm thinking of that opening story you have in the book. If I ever shown up in the schoolyard wearing a fedora with a feather in it, I don't even want to think what the kids were. Thank you. I, I can relate to that. He's, re he's referring, uh, since you haven't seen the book yet, but there's a piece um, which is, um, it's really, I don't often write first person. I do occasionally. And this first piece in this, in this recent collection is a first person account of World War II. I didn't go into the tale about my Italian uncles in the fascist army as I did tonight. But it's that period I'm writing about. And my father is a tailor, insisted that I dress well because it reflected upon him, he thought. And also, I did dress well as a little mannequin. All of his clothes were, all of my clothes were made by him. So the references, and I had a fedora. I still wear a fedora, you might know, if you saw me coming in. And I wore it in high school. I mean, in grammar school, parochial grammar school. I mean, so I was always knocking it off in the bus. That's all. It's a little piece. You'll, you'll see it. Any other questions? Oh, you have a question. Uh, you left the Times around 1965. Exactly. You were a relative. I know you. Well, we, we met before. Jack Shanley. Oh, you're Jack. Of course I know your father. Jack Shanley was the, he's the son of a very, very distinguished television critic from the 60s, the 60s when I was on the paper. Uh, you were a relatively young guy, and most of the people that my dad worked with, well, life is. Never left the Times. When you left, did you have any kind of insecurities? You, know, you had a regular paycheck. I'm, sure you had a paycheck. I'm asked uh, by Mr. Shanley, the son of a veteran New York Times man that I knew, that when I left the paper, did I have any insecurities? Well, of course I had. In I have insecurities now, but it has nothing to do with leaving the paper. When I left the paper, I was maybe 31. It was in 65. My wife and I had a daughter of one who's here tonight, 75 years old. No, no, she don't. No, no, she's kidding. 50 or something. And I wanted, I didn't leave the paper because I didn't love the paper. I left the paper because it was a daily paper and I couldn't meet the daily deadlines with happiness because I wanted to have more than a day. I wanted several days. I wanted weeks. And I wanted more room. I wanted to write 5,000. So I left, and for one year, I wrote for Esquire, and I did these pieces. Now, let's jump ahead today. I still feel that my happy days were during that almost decade as a reporter, 1955 to 1965. I also sometimes wonder, since I only read the paper, I don't read anything online, I read the newspaper, I get it delivered, I go down and pick it up and I read it, it takes me two hours. And I read about digital stuff, and this is digital, I don't know what they're talking about. But then yesterday, or what's it the day before, it sounds like an opening line from The Stranger, was it yesterday, I saw an article um, by a name I had never heard, Caitlin Dickinson, Caitlin Dickinson. And I read this article, and it said the headline something like, America or Mexico, I think it was called. And what it was about was a Mexican father in, in, in New York, married to an American-born woman who was a teacher, and they had two children, I think six daughters, six and four. And they were worried about, with Trump taking over, the father would be sent back. And rather than wait to have the, the father banished, the family, this is the article I'm talk, just trying to describe. The story is about the family's decision, maybe we'll go back to Mexico before we get thrown out, we better think about this. And they're thinking about it. This, the story's about the family, the interior concern of this one family, the children, the confusion that the wife 
who had a good job as a teacher, healthcare, etc. She'd have to give that up, go back to the Mexican village where the father came from. And she, the wife, the mother, the school teacher, the mother, the had been to that place, and there's no opportunity for women there, and the women were domestics, so there's no job as a teacher. She'd be giving up all the achievements that she earned as a teacher, education, becoming a teacher, being rewarded as a teacher. And her husband was not a formally educated person. He had been in construction, but his job, because his wife was full-time teacher, he'd take care of the kids during the day, and at night he'd work in a bar. This was the life they live. And now the new president, with his policies, prompted or drove them to this desperate decision, shall we get out of here before we're thrown out of here? That writing by that woman named Dickinson was wonderful. And I thought, there's hope for journalism. So today, I, how in the hell do I reach here? Well, you call the goddamn New York Times. You, know, the, the, you don't get real people. You get the you know, voicemail, this and that. This and that. It took me about a half hour to get to somebody, a living person. And this was the, I went to speak to the editor of the National Desk. This was during the National section. It took me another half hour to get that guy to return my call. Who is Caitlin, I hope I'm, I think it's Caitlin Dickinson. I wrote her name down, so excuse me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm right, Caitlin, C-A-I-T-L-I-N, Dickinson. Dickerson, excuse me, Dickerson. I said, I want to talk to her. And you, you, she won't talk to you on the phone. You have to email her. I email her. And before I was coming over here, I get the phone call. It's her. I said, listen, young lady, this is terrific. Who are you? How would you get the job? How old are you? 27. How long have you been in the Times? Oh, three weeks. Jesus. <laughs> wow. You are really good. If I had written that piece I told her today, if I'd, I would have been proud of that piece. That would have been written in 1955. And here we are, 2017. So this paper hasn't changed. The technology and all the digital bullshit you read about, it hasn't changed. What is it? That woman, footwork. She, she, she hung out with those people. She won the trust of those people. If you people can remember, it's Thursday, is it not? It's Tuesday's paper. Go try to read this thing on your online or however you read the paper. Caitlin Dickinson. Read it, and that so that journalism, great journalism, is still around. Daily journalism. So, that's, so I'm very, I feel I haven't left the paper because I sought, I wanted to know who that person is. That person could have been me. I've, I've never heard the phrase online spoken of with such contempt, and and <laughs> as if it was sort of pornography or something <laughs> well, like that. Anyway. We, we have time for one more quick question. I know someone has. Yes. Say enough. Jesus, we got does everyone go to Columbia, for God's sake? <laughs> Did you graduate in Columbia? I'm oh, you're there now. Yeah. Um, and Where are you from? South Korea. Okay, go ahead. And uh, you spoke a little bit about the fact that you have insecurities now, and I wonder how do you get confidence in your work? How do you get confidence? You're still insecure. Um, what I mean by insecure because it might not be what you might think I mean. When I have a story, as I have an, I have an idea for a story, I told the New Yorker about it, but I haven't started it yet because I am not sure how I'm going to start it. I'm also doing something else in the book. But I'm saying that the insecurity, it isn't so much insecurity, but it's never being blasé or thinking, oh, I know what I'm doing, I know how I'm going to do it, it's going to be another picnic for me. The writing is never a picnic. It's always hard. And each time you begin anew with another assignment, <clears throat> the research followed by the organization, followed by the writing, the rewriting, the rewriting, the rewriting, it never comes out. The first sentence is, before you settle for that first sentence, has been written many, many times. If you're a careful writer, you must know that. But what I mean to say about insecure, I never feel that I'm totally in command. I always feel it's, I hate to use the word challenge. One of the worst things about this word is everybody uses everything as a challenge. Everything's challenging. Oh, God. Let's not say it's a challenge. But let's say it's a new experience. 
it is always a new experience for me. It's not that I have 60 years of this, oh, and I know what I'm doing. No, I always think I'm starting for the first time. And the next question you ask me is, I don't have a clue what you ask me. What you ask me? How do you stay confident? How do you stay confident? How you stay confident is how do you get to be confident in the first place? And how do you get to be confident? You get to be confident, competent, or confident, or both, competent and confident, because you are satisfied you did your best. One of the things in, in all these more than a half a century, published in newspapers and magazines, small books, longer books, what gives me confidence and also satisfaction is I never, never did anything I was ashamed of. I never wrote something I wish I hadn't written. I never wrote something about people that brought me or them shame. I never wrote for their approval. I never showed anybody in advance what I was doing. I never ghosted anything. I never, But I always felt I have to be honorable about my work. And I have to show respect to people as I would want to be respected. So the idea of having a relationship, in my head at least, if not always in fact, with people that I thought was a significant relationship, brought to me in my work a lifetime's belief I did my best. And if you believe you've done your best, God, if that doesn't give you confidence and competence, nothing will. Well, that you seems, understand? That seems like a perfect place to end it. Thank you so much Thank for you being very much. here. Thank you. <laughs>